Precision medicine, is it hype or help, fact or fiction? Welcome to Precision Insight. This is a podcast series where the most influential thought leaders and innovators in healthcare sit with me to chat about the latest technologies and tools of precision medicine. What is coming up in the near future? If you want to know more about this incredibly fast moving field of research and development, stay tuned. So it's my real privilege to be talking to Tom Parry, uh, who is president of the Integrated Benefits Institute. Uh, before co-founding the IBI, he served 11 years as research director at the California Works Compensation Institute. His research there encompassed a wide variety of topics in workers' compensation, including medical treatment patterns, vocational rehabilitation, costs and effectiveness, legal costs and trends, medical utilization, mental stress claims, and physical therapy patterns of care. While there, Parry was engaged in some of the earliest research and analysis on 24-hour coverage and integrated benefits. He speaks on integrated benefits in health and productivity issues at conferences and symposia in the United States and internationally. He served for five years as research advisor to the Roadway Express Medical Board, and he's received a bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees from University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Tom, it's great to have you with us. As a family physician, my uh, involvement with um, uh, the integrated benefits, if you like, is usually writing those reports uh, about my patients who I think need more time off or graduated returns. So <laughs> a real privilege to actually talk with you and, and have a little bit of a conversation about um, where uh, benefits um, are going, where uh, the direction is. So if you mm -hmm. could start off by telling us a little bit more about IBI, the Integrated Benefits Institute, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Dr. Doss. Yeah, I'm... Um Started IBI uh, about 24 years ago, really following my work at the California Workers' Comp Institute and that early work on 24-hour coverage. And we did research in the early 90s comparing medical delivery in the group health system in California with the medical delivery uh, in workers' compensation in California and saw some really significant differences in the way care was delivered depending on when the, if the condition was an occupational condition or non-occupational. Oh. And that got me really thinking about why is it that different kinds of programs deliver different types of medical care? I mean, it's all the same people. The employer has an interest in having healthy, productive people at work. Employees certainly have an interest in being healthy and at work generating their full wages. So why it, are there these differences? And that really launched IBI in 1995 as an independent not-for-profit research organization to try to help employers, on the one hand, better understand the full dimensions and full impacts of health, particularly as they related to absence, disability, performance, and productivity, and to help organizations that provided services to employers better understand their own position relative to that uh, string of benefits and those connections. So today we have about 1,100 uh, corporate sponsors of IBI's work, um, employers, about, about two-thirds of the Fortune 100, all the way down to employers with a couple hundred lives. And on the other side of the equation, we have major health plans and consultants and brokers and disability companies and assets management companies, pharmaceuticals wellness organizations, the entire spectrum of organizations that work with an employer that have an interest in reframing the discussion about what health is and what health means. That's fantastic. I mean, I, from the consumer point of view as a, a physician, I just see this uh, so dramatically, some of the disparity uh, in, in care of patients who have the same injury, same disability, um, and the, the provision can be very, very different. And we, we do actually don't know which is best in, in terms of outcomes. So it's mm -hmm. great to hear that there is research going on into this because it is such an important area. In, in terms of the overall scope of the problem, uh, do you have any information about how big this is uh, with em poor employee health for employers? Mm -hmm. Well, we've, um, one of the things that we do here is uh, built a variety of different statistical models. And one that we rely on tells us that for every dollar an employer spends on health care, 
there's about 60 cents in lost time and lost productivity. So it's a very, very major economic impact for employers. <clears throat> and I think what is happening, there's a real tension right now in the U.S. around what's being called consumerism. So we have a growing number of employers that are putting in place high deductible plans uh, on the group health side. And that really means employees will pay more in deductibles, co-pays, and co-insurance. Now, that may look really good in the short term for the employer because, by definition, their health care premiums will be reduced because they have higher deductibles. The real question in this is how does that affect employees' access to medical care? And do they delay medical care? Do they forgo medical care? And if they do, then the employee's health suffers. Yeah. And at the very same time, they tend to miss work more often. And when they go to work, they tend not to perform as well. And that's a bad bargain for the employer and certainly for the employee as well. So a lot of our, our work really focuses on how do we align benefit design across these programs, ultimately to demonstrate to employers that good health is good business. Yes. I mean, I think that that, that is what you're saying makes absolute sense, because I can see situations where people would uh, put off taking the drug, they may come to the doctor and, and say, uh, you know, they recognize their blood pressure is high or whatever, but because of the cost of the drugs and uh, the situation they're in with their insurance or provider, they, they may then delay treatment or, or not take it um, at all, uh, which leads to worse outcomes. So yes, I mean, exactly. And is there a lot of variation then in companies uh, in terms of their provision that some have high copay and, and others have less? And do you have data about how those patients' um, health or employees' health actually? Uh, actually, we're in the process of um, designing a study right now uh, that looks at the full impacts of high deductible plans, not just on the medical and pharmacy part of it but also on absence from work, disability, uh, and workers' compensation as well. Yes. So ultimately, we believe there's a strong incentive, both for employees to be healthy. I mean, let's face it, it's much better to be healthy than unhealthy, yeah. but also for employers to have a healthy workforce. And it really, you know, historically, employers have tended to organize their benefit programs in what we call separate silos. So the group health programs in one place in the organization. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, uh, management of the pharmacy benefit is in a different place. Disability is in a separate third place and workers' compensation often is not part of the equation at all by way of discussion. And so what we try to do is, is essentially say, look, instead of organizing your programs so the program leaders have every incentive to shift cost and shift risk either to employees or to other parts of the organization and other programs. That's a bad bargain for everyone. So let's see how we can align incentives by way of design and show how these connect and ultimately affect the performance of the business. Because if we can start to look at those links relative to business performance, then we can change the conversation about benefits from one solely of cost to one of business value contribution. And we think if we can do that and help employers do that, it absolutely changes the landscape of health and health benefits. It, it, it's fascinating that uh, because I work in the, in the public system in Canada where we actually simulate that process. So we have a, a therapeutics benefit silo within our Ministry of Health and then we have other silos. Um, and your comment about shifting budgets is absolutely, you can see this in, in the big health authorities where uh, you are trying to do a coordinated plan for mental health or diabetes or, or whatever problem and you have to talk to stakeholders in very different silos who mm -hmm. say, well, that's not my problem. Uh, if you're talking to the pharmaceutical or benefits, um, they say, well, that, that's actually physical therapy you need to be talked to or someone. <laughs> and, you know, for, for structuring care, it makes a huge problem. I mean, in, in 
in any large organization delivering health, if you have these silos, we, we know that they are going to get in the way of, of new models of care. So it's great to hear that you're actually starting to explore that and maybe create some solutions that we can use not just for employers, but actually for large healthcare organizations. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, what I see going on here in the U.S. is there's this growing focus on the value of health. Yes. I mean, why is health important? And here employers invest, you know, tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars yeah. in health programs. Yeah. And eventually the question comes up, well, what are we doing this for as an employer? Why is health important? Yeah. And that is, is the question that ultimately employers need to, to be able to address. We've done uh, several major surveys with chief financial officers. And what's really interesting, I think, is that people assume that CFOs only care about short-term dollars. But what our surveys tell us is that CFOs actually think quite broadly about health. In fact, in our latest survey, fewer than half the CFOs said their most important goal of their health program is to save health care costs. Huh. They, t they talk about attraction and retention of employees. They talk hmm. about improving business processes and productivity. So there's this big disconnect between people who manage benefits and the more strategic role of CFOs. And so if we can start connecting those dots around the value of health, both for employees and employers, that can change the discussion about why we invest in health and, and ultimately what everyone is is uh, garnering from those investments yeah i mean the value of health is a a, a really nice term because we i've come across you know material that talks about return on investment and that sort of is more uh, uh i mean i get it why you would need that but value of health is is definitely a phrase that um uh, seems to resonate in in terms mm -hmm. of of the age of the workforce, as we go forward, we've got an aging population and more people are work working into their late 60s and 70s. Um, Does do your organization have research to do with uh, the older worker and uh, implications for health provision from an employer perspective? You know, I think what we see with older workers and you know, I'm an older worker. <laughs> I actually will be 71 in about a month. Out of I'm an older you worker. 55, Tom. Sorry. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Um, and, and I think you know what what we see is certainly the challenges of older workers are important. Is as we get older, our our bodies change, and and we certainly don't do the things we once did. But from the standpoint of being at work and supporting older workers. I think that the support of managing their health, um, making sure they have a broad approach to their health, not only simply around health care, but diet, exercise, and the things that support their health, including behavioral health. Because I think a lot of times we see older workers that are still in the workforce, perhaps not because they want to, but because financially they have to. And that presents a whole broader set of, of issues for employers to support their older employees around their financial health yes. as well as their well-being. So I think that, that uh, as, as employers think about supporting um, older employees, they're recognizing that the human capital, if you will, represented in the experience of older employees is really important. I mean, here we are in this economic environment with very low unemployment rates. Yes. Uh, employers are having a very hard time finding people to, to successfully do jobs, which means they have to keep their older employees healthy and at work and really take advantage of all that experience they've built careers in, in, in developing. Totally. No, I, absolutely. I mean, part of the issue in terms of looking after an older workforce is that they will be taking more medication. Um, and that sort of brings me to my next question is, do you see organizations um, starting to implement precision medicine plans of uh, provision of uh, pharmacogenetics, those sorts of testing mm -hmm. workforce? So, you know, I think that that's becoming a, a very important uh, issue for employers because as those new technologies develop, um, 
in the short term, they look expensive, whether it's precision medicine or genomics or specialty pharmaceuticals. Now they have the promise perhaps of, of, being, of doing a better job of targeting conditions and successfully treating them, but oftentimes in the short term, the medical cost impacts are higher than more traditional, perhaps less e invasive approaches. And that's why it's so critical to address this value question. Now, I've actually had uh, a number of, of conversations in the last several months, months with these new medical technology companies. Uh, and you know what I find is they tend to come out either of the high tech industry or the medical care industry, and the people who develop these new technologies often often have no idea of the setting in which these technologies will be used in the employer setting, and they have no idea how to talk to employers about their value. They know clinically they're good, and they automatically assume, well, if they're clinically good, that means they're going to be adopted in the marketplace, and that's absolutely not true. So it even emphasizes more the importance of, of taking this broader health value approach because you need to, with these new technologies, understand the full impacts and the downstream impacts of their implementation. Yes, absolutely. And, and in terms of identifying if you're an employer, uh, the, um, the health of your employees, it, it, I mean, you're talking about doing research into the value of health, but that assumes that we know the health of the employees. Uh, mm -hmm. Are there ways um, for organizations to understand, to aggregate that data into a meaning? Obviously, they don't want to know the individual's health. That's not appropriate, but they want to know, right. you know, I would have thought, is this, a, do we have a workforce who is at high risk of musculoskeletal? Yes. Mm -hmm. Are there ways of doing that? Yeah, there are uh, a number of ways to do that. And the worst way to do that is to only look at your claims costs because all your claims costs tell you is what's under treatment. And particularly, as I mentioned with high deductible plans, if employees are either not getting care or delaying care, the employer has even a worse view of the health of their workforce. So I think there are a number of ways to do that. Certainly, biometric testing is, is one way but also health risk assessments. And there are a number that take a very broad approach to health. We worked uh, over the years with uh, Dr. Ron Kessler at Harvard Medical School and, and Dr. Uh, Deborah Lerner at Tufts in their health risk assessments, which take a very broad view of health, not what the doctor is treating you for, but what conditions are influencing your health and what are the outcomes of your health by way of your ability to go to work and the like? So those data sets become really important parts of an employer better understanding the kinds of conditions that exist in the workforce. And this is absolutely true with behavioral health conditions mm. because oftentimes behavioral health is, goes untreated but is having a deleterious effect on an employee's well-being, their ability to go to work and perform at work. So these other data sets become really important if the employer is to truly understand on the front end the profile of health and health risk and start to connect it to the back end of performance of the business. Fantastic. And I mean, I came across some or did some work with a group who were looking at willingness to change of patients as well. So we actually did a, a short questionnaire of lifestyle um, uh, characteristics. So alcohol, smoking um, and any other sort of risk uh, activities. And then asked, would you, are you ready to talk about those if they were um, unusually high? So alcohol, smoking, etc. And that was very interesting. A lot of people didn't actually feel there was a need to talk to their physician, even though they mm -hmm. may have had high risk. Are, are people in the employer business starting to do add that to it? Because it's great to have a, uh, a snapshot of the quality of health of your employees. But if you don't know whether they'd be willing to take an exercise program, nutritional advice, whatever it is, it may backfire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this, you know, this is where the physician becomes really important. And um, probably 15 years ago, we worked with the American Medical Association to survey physicians on their, their role in managing disabilities. 
And what was really interesting is the physicians we surveyed said, we believe being back at work is good medicine, mm. but employers keep trying to squeeze us by way of reimbursement. So how can they possibly expect us to play a larger role with their employees <laughs> when they're not willing to reimburse us for our time to do that? And I think what I see happening is physicians will be become more and more important around these broader issues, which means they have to be able to spend time with uh, patients and employees, and they have to be reimbursed for it. Now, uh, many employers, many large employers, are putting on on-site, putting in on-site medical facilities to provide that kind of support. We did a, a case study with American Express a couple of years ago, and they understood how important it was to support their employees in their health. And they provided a wide variety of services on site in order to do that. Now, that meant that their employees could actually spend more time with medical professionals discussing their conditions, their health and the like, and get guidance rather than getting that, you know, seven minute uh, patient encounter. And then they have to leave because the physician has to move on to the next patient. Yeah. That sounds, I mean, that's, a, that's an altruistic uh, approach by a company, but I expect that uh, their CFO is also talking about the value of health. Uh, well, that's exactly right. You know, I, I uh, worked very closely uh, with the medical director at Amex, Dr. Wayne Burton, uh, and he really has been a leading researcher on the employer side. And his whole focus in his conversations with their senior leaders is the value of health. I and mean, he could actually demonstrate to senior leaders how it is influencing the performance metrics of their business. And as soon as he was able to do that, it made it demonstrably clear to the organization why they were investing in these programs for the health of their employees. Yes, they did eventually affect the medical trend, but more importantly, they had positive outcomes on the performance of the business and that's why, let's face it, that's why employers have employees, <laughs> that we have to connect the dots to demonstrate that value of health to them. Yeah. Tom, that's, that's uh, I think, a, a great place to, uh, to, to finish on, connecting the dots. Um, uh, I really appreciate your time uh, talking with us. And it's been really educational for me and also very positive to hear what is being done and can be done. So thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thank you, Dr. Doss.